Welcome back to the deep dive. Today we're digging into some really interesting new research uh, about representing complex 3D shapes. The big goal is always accuracy, yeah, but the real challenge, doing it efficiently. We're looking specifically at sine distance functions, SDFs. They're super versatile. You see them in simulations, rendering, all over. But, you know, getting a good continuous fit for complex shapes, that's always been a bit tricky, especially with some of the methods used today. Exactly. And uh, the paper we're diving into introduces this method called eFunk. What's really different about it, its core mission, is aiming for that high quality representation without relying on huge neural networks or those, well, complex data structures that a lot of the top methods use right now. It's a different approach. Right. So our main source today is the paper eFunk, an efficient function representation without neural networks by Biao Zhang and Peter Wonka from Kaust. It's up on RCV. Plus some notes we have, our mission unpack the uh, the academic thinking, the innovations behind eFunk. We want to understand not just what it is, but how it tackles the problem differently and, you know, why that really matters. Okay, let's get into it. Before we dive headfirst into eFunk, maybe we should set the scene a bit. Sign distance functions STFs. You said they're a big deal in graphics. We hear about them for surface reconstruction, shape analysis, collision detection. What makes them so useful? What exactly are they? Yeah, good starting point. Think of an SDF as um, an implicit way to define a shape surface. So instead of a mesh, like triangles, explicitly mapping the boundary, an SDF tells you, for any point in space, the shortest distance to the surface. And it's signed negative if you're inside, positive if you're outside. Zero means you're right on the surface. This gives you some great advantages. It's compact, it's flexible, it naturally defines a smooth surface. And uh, calculating things like surface normals is easy. It's just the gradient of the SDF. Got it. Okay. Implicit distance-based. Makes sense. So where do neural networks fit in, MLPs specifically? Feels like they're everywhere now for function approximation. What are their limits when you apply them to these continuous SDFs? You're right, they don't kind of dominate. A lot of the recent state-of-the-art methods do use neural nets, usually MOPs. Often they combine them with uh, data structures like hatching grids or oct trees. That helps capture fine details. And they can represent really complex shapes very accurately, no doubt about that. But they often need a huge number of parameters, you know, in the network itself. Or they lean heavily on the complexity of those grids or trees. This can make them, well, a bit bulky to train and use. And critically, there's sort of black box nature and dependence on these structures. That can make it tricky to integrate them into other deep learning stuff, like, say, building a generative model that directly outputs these SDFs. That complexity, that parameter count, that's really what eFunk is trying to tackle. And this leads into a really neat framework the paper proposes for analyzing how we model continuous functions generally. They write it as OQ equals DFQ. It helps break down the process. F is the core function representation itself. And D is a decoder. It takes what F gives you for a query point Q and turns it into the final output OQ, which for us is the sine distance value. Okay, so FQ gets you some kind of intermediate thing based on your point Q, and then D decodes that into the final SDF value. Exactly. And using this, they classify methods into three types. It's in table one in the paper. Type I is the most direct, the decoder D. It's just an identity function. So OQ is FQ. The representation is the output. A lot of classic methods like simple grid interpolation fit here. Type I, that's the pure neural network approach. D is an MLP, but F is just identity. It just passes the point Q through. So OQ equals MLP F Q. Simple structure, but they can struggle with complex details unless the MLP is huge, and sometimes they converge slowly at first. Then there's type three. This is where many recent successful methods like instant NGP fall. D is an MLB again. But F uses interpolation, often with those grids or hash tables. But, and this is important, they're usually interpolating high dimensional vectors or features stored at the grid points not the final FDF value itself. The MLP, D, then takes this interpolated feature vector and decodes that into the scalar distance. OQ equals MLP FQ. Ah, okay, so type three uses the grid for features, then an MLP decodes those features. Precisely, and what's really interesting, academically speaking, is that eFunk deliberately positions itself back in type ID as identity. FFQ directly gives you OQ. This choice is fundamental to why it can be so parameter efficient. It ditches that separate MLP decoder entirely. Okay, right. Type I, no MLP decoder, that's clear. But if FFQ is the output, what's the big innovation in F itself? How does eFunk get high quality representation without that decoder or, you know, tons of parameters? This is really the core academic insight of the work. It does use interpolation, like some older type I methods. But the key difference, the real shift, is moving from interpolating simple scalar values or maybe feature vectors, 
to what they call function interpolation. Figure two in the paper shows this really well. Function interpolation. Okay, that sounds different. More than just blending numbers. What does that actually mean? It means exactly that. Instead of each grid point, they call them keys, just storing a number or a vector. Each key in eFunk has an entire continuous function associated with it. And this function is parameterized by learnable parameters, phi. The final value at any query point q comes from blending these functions based on how close q is to each key. Equation 11 shows this. It's a weighted sum of the outputs of each key's function. Okay, so you're blending whole functions, not just values. How do they figure out the blending weights? They use normalized radial basis functions, RBFs. Specifically, it's a softmax normalized exponential of the negative squared distance between the query point q and the key key. That's equation 10. RBFs are pretty standard for this kind of thing. They give you a nice smooth fall off points closer to a key, have way more influence. Right. And what are these functions attached to each key? So they're learnable. Yes, learnable parameters define them. And here's the really clever part, the bit that makes this type I approach work so well academically. The value at each key isn't just a scalar. It's a simple polynomial function. And critically, it's a polynomial of the relative vector between the query point and the key. So that's equation 12. They use truncated polynomials like 10th order is just a constant value. First order adds linear terms like a tilted plane. Second order adds quadratic terms, giving it some curvature. Ah, okay, I think I'm getting it. So it's like each point on the grid doesn't just hold a number. It holds like a little mini function, a local recipe for the shape. And the final SDF value is the sum of all these little local function contributions blended smoothly based on distance. That is really interesting. It feels like it's capturing the function's behavior directly. Exactly. That's a great way to put it. By interpolating these parameterized polynomial functions, eFunk encodes local shape and smoothness much more directly. It gets expressive power without needing a big separate MLP to figure things out from abstract features. The polynomial degree lets you control how complex those local functions are. Higher degrees can capture more intricate local details, though you probably hit diminishing returns or instability eventually. Makes sense. So you have these grid points, each with a polynomial function. Right. But then to get even better detail, especially right near the surface where things change quickly, they add an optional extra bit. It's called O plus delta in the paper, equation 16. They add learnable offsets, delta I, to some of the grid points, the keys. So instead of being stuck at a fixed grid position key, these points can actually move a little. Two key plus delta I. This lets these specific grid points shift and kind of cluster near important parts of the surface. It really boosts the detail right where you need it. Figures 4 and 8 show this quite clearly. Okay, so the grid isn't totally fixed. Some of these function centers can actually nudge themselves closer to the surface to capture the tricky bits. Precisely. And they even have a smart way to initialize these offsets. It's inspired by the mean shift algorithm, equation 17. This mean shift initialization tries to place these movable points near the surface samples from the input okay. data right from the start. It helps speed up training because they're already roughly in the right place clever. Okay, better detail near the surface, but adding learnable polynomials and learnable positions. How does eFunk stay efficient? Sounds like it could get computationally heavy fast. Ah, yes. This is where the engineering and algorithmic side is just as important as the conceptual framework. It's a huge part of the contribution. The main calculation, remember, is that sum over all the keys for every single query point to get the final value, EQ11. Now, if you just plug this into a standard framework like PyTorch using its automatic differentiation, well, to calculate the gradients for learning, it needs to store all the intermediate results of those sums. This leads to memory use that scales with uh, FATO IJ. I is the number of keys, grid points. J is the number of query points. With, say, a 32-cubed grid that's over 32,000 keys and large patches of queries, this OIJ memory cost. It explodes. You run out of GPU memory very quickly. Ouch. Yeah, I can see how that would be a problem. Absolutely critical. So they developed custom QA accelerated algorithms. Algorithm 1 for the forward pass, algorithm 2 for backward. Figure 5 gives a visual idea. By creating these fused CUDA kernels, they do the whole summation inside the kernel. They avoid writing all those intermediate products back to the GPU's main memory. The computation just focuses on getting the sums and gradients needed on the fly. This flashes memory use down to theta j. It only scales with the batch size, not the grid size. Wow. Okay. So they had to write custom low-level GPU code specifically for this function interpolation math. That's serious commitment, not just designing the model architecture. It really is. And this optimization is what makes the whole method practical. Table 5 shows the difference. Memory use drops to less than 10% of the naive way, and it's like 10 times faster or even more. They mentioned it's kind of similar in spirit to flash attention, which also uses fused kernels to avoid memory bottlenecks and transformers.
and the payoff for the user. The payoff is huge. It means you can actually train and run this on much more accessible hardware. Lower end desktop GPUs become viable. Table 6 has some comparison showing this. It makes high quality 3D fitting more democratic, really. Okay, efficient, accessible. But how good is it? How does it stack up against those state of the art methods, the type 3 ones with the big NNs and grids? That's the real test, right? Definitely. The paper focuses on 3D SDF fitting performance. You see examples in figure 1, table 3 is where you see the comparisons. Let's take eFunk with a 32 cubed grid, polynomial degree 1, using the O plus delta offsets that's often their best setup. This version has about 0.43 million parameters. That's uh, 323 keys times 13 parameters per key for the polynomial terms offset and scale. It achieves comparable, sometimes even better, chamfer distance. That's a standard quality metric compared to things like instant NGP, which uses like 14.2 million parameters. 14 million compared to less than half a million. Wow. Yeah. Or NGLOD with 10.1 million, FFN with around 0.46 million, diff grid with 5.3 million, chamfer distance, uh, basically measures how close your reconstructed surface is to the true one. Lower is better. In Table 3, E-Funk 323 by 13 gets a mean CD of 9.227. That's actually a bit better than Instant NGP's 9.288, and GLOD's 9.273, and FFN's 9.390. So it's matching or beating these methods, sometimes significantly, with way fewer parameters, especially compared to Instant NGP and GLOD diff grid, it's competitive with FFN on parameter count, but still slightly better on average quality. That really shows the parameter efficiency. That is seriously compelling. State-of-the-art quality, fraction of the parameters. But you mentioned instant NGP. Isn't that one famous for being incredibly fast to train, like minutes? Is there a speed trade-off here with eFunk? That's a very fair point, and the paper's open about it. While their CDA code is way faster than a naive version, eFunk is currently slower to train and run than something like Instant NGP, which is highly optimized. Table 6 hints at this Instant NGP might train in under 5 minutes, while eFunk might be closer to 20 minutes for a similar task. So yes, for now, you trade some speed for that parameter efficiency and simpler structure. They do think more optimization is possible, though. Okay, so a speed consideration, still impressive parameter efficiency. And I also did a neat comparison, uh, not against neural nets, but against a traditional method. Figure dad, they compared eFunk O plus Delta, use about 426,000 parameters against a standard high-resolution trilinear interpolation grid. They made the grid dense enough, 763, to have a similar number of parameters, around 439,000. eFunk achieved much better quality. It shows the power isn't just how many parameters, but how you use them. The function interpolation idea is fundamentally better than just interpreting scalar values for the same parameter budget. That really highlights the core idea, doesn't it? It does, and the ablation studies, Table 4, they back up the design choices, too. Things like the learnable offsets and scales, important. Higher polynomial degrees, helpful at two degree too. That mean shift initialization speeds things up. There's another big plus that comes directly from eFunk being a type I method. From its math, it's analytically tractable because it's built from explicit smooth functions polynomials, RBS not some complex layered MLP. You can calculate derivatives analytically, like gradients with respect to the query point. Equations 13 and 14 show this. Ah, so you don't need to do complex backpropagation through a network just to find, say, the surface normal. Exactly. Normal estimation needs the gradient. And here it's just straightforward calculation. Figure 13 shows results and other things that need gradients, like enforcing iconal constraints, that the SDF gradient magnitude should be one, or doing spear tracing for rendering, which uses the SDF value and gradient. They become much easier to integrate because the math is explicit. That makes sense. More transparent math, easier derivatives. Right. And the paper shows some other cool applications that leverage this structure and maybe interpretability. Figure 12 does a frequency decomposition showing how it captures different detail levels. And figure 14 is really neat intuitive shape manipulation. Because the parameters live on this regular grid, you can do simple operations directly on those grid parameters. Like they show taking the parameters from half of one shape's grid and half of another's grid and just combining them to blend the shapes. Oh, wow. So you can directly edit the representation in a spatial way. Kind of, yeah. It gives you a level of direct control that's often much harder with abstract neural network weights. You're manipulating something that feels closer to the object's actual structure. That sounds really powerful for artists or designers. It could be. Now, obviously, we need to touch on limitations, too. The authors are clear about these. We mentioned the speed training and inference are currently slower than hyper-optimized methods like instant NGP. Maybe future work can improve that. And there's a current scaling limit they hit with their specific CUDA implementation. Because of how GPU kernels work with threads and blocks, they found it hard to push efficiently beyond maybe a 643 grid, 
to really large resolutions like 1283. Hierarchical methods sometimes handle that scale more easily. Again, maybe addressable with more engineering. Okay, speed and current scaling cap, good to know. What about future plans? They mentioned wanting to extend eFunk towards 3D generative modeling, maybe plugging it into diffusion models or autoregressive setups. Its structure might be beneficial there. And also exploring if it works well for other data types like 2D images or even 4D data. Right. So wrapping up our deep dive here, we've explored eFunk, which feels like a really fresh take on representing 3D shakes. It consciously steps back for the huge neural nets and complex data structures we see a lot. And it achieves, you know, state-of-the-art quality for SDF fitting, but with way, way fewer parameters. The core academic idea seems to be this function interpolation using polynomials at each grid point, combined with some really smart, dedicated CUDA optimization to make it actually work efficiently. That's the heart of it, absolutely. Shifting from interpolating values or feature vectors to interpolating these continuous parameterized functions on a grid. It's a structured yet powerful way to represent these continuous fields, and it seems inherently more parameter efficient, at least for this SDF task, than just relying on a big black box MLP. Okay, so here's something to leave you with. We know knowledge is most useful when it's understood and applied, right? So thinking about making these complex 3D representations much more parameter efficient easier to run on standard computers, and potentially much more interpretable and directly manipulable, which is what eFunk is aiming for. How might that change how we create, how we share, maybe even how we interact with 3D content down the line? Something to ponder? 